Father, may these spoken words be faithful to the written word and lead us to the living word. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A bit nasally this morning. I'm, I'm not sick. I think it's allergies with these up and down temperatures. I'm not sure, but I, I can hear it, so I apologize for that. It gets annoying, but we'll make it through this. We got a well-known, needless to say, well-known passage this morning, theologically packed with information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with the reality of the law during the sermon, and then we'll, we'll move on. We'll move on to Jesus' topic of salt and light during the communion meditation. As always, there's uh, space reserved in your bulletins, as there is each and every week, to take notes, should you be interested in doing so on the rear of your bulletin. Well, you saw the title of the sermon, so let's begin with this. How many of us consider ourselves to be law-abiding individuals? Law-abiding individuals. Raise your hands. I'm going to take a second. Sherry Hopton, is your hand up? Okay, okay. I pay careful attention to this one. All right. A few hands I didn't see up. A few didn't surprise me, but I, I want to be sure. Well, most of us take it for granted, don't we? We take it for granted that most of the laws in our society are worthwhile. Most of the laws in our society are reasonable, and we're, of course, thankful for them. Laws, as I think we all understand, Laws are absolutely essential to keeping us safe and providing us with, let's just say, an orderly society. But ever so often, we encounter a law that has unintended consequences. Unintended consequences. For example, many states enact laws to protect of course, the general public from those who have previously committed a crime. And one way that they do this is by limiting the types of jobs that former criminals can hold. Now, the state of Ohio alone has created over 500 laws. Over 500 laws to ensure that former criminals who have served their time cannot do such things as vote. And then I wanted to quote from here on on. They can't operate a racetrack. They cannot cut hair. They cannot sit on a jury. They cannot provide hospice care. They cannot deal in livestock. They cannot broker real estate. They cannot obtain a license to repair air conditioning systems. Were you aware of all that? That's all prohibited. That's Ohio State law. The American Bar Association. American Bar Association, they did a study to see how many laws such as these are related to keeping former criminals out of certain jobs. They found no less than 46 thousand laws, 46,000 laws across the United States that limit the activities of former criminals. And the unintended consequence, the unintended consequence of many of these laws, as you might guess, is higher unemployment, of course. Higher unemployment levels among former criminals, which results quite naturally and higher crime rates. Now, that's not what the lawmakers intended. That's not what they intended at all, but often that's what happens. The law of unintended consequences. 
Now this law is sometimes referred to, and perhaps you've heard of this, this law is sometimes referred to as the cobra effect. Have you heard of this? The cobra effect. Many years ago, understand, many years ago, parts of India, they were being overrun with cobras. I mean, it was becoming a real problem. That is a problem, isn't it? I'd consider that a problem. The British government began offering financial rewards to Indian citizens who caught and killed cobras and turned in their dead bodies to local authorities. Now, what would you guess would happen? The incentives, the incentives for turning in dead cobras were so good that some Indian citizens began breeding cobras. <laughs> and that's a fact. They began breeding, can you imagine this? Lori would never allow it. <laughs> breeding cobras, friends, just so they could kill them and turn them in for reward money. And that, in turn, produced a bumper crop of cobras, which is a scary thought. That's a scary thought. In the southern part of the United States, the cobra effect could be called the kudzu effect. Kudzu effect. Kudzu is, I'm sure, many, am I pronouncing that right, kudzu? Yeah, when I read this, I thought, i got to get this in a sermon. It's another perfect example. Kudzu is a plant that was imported from Japan. It came from Japan to the United States in the 1800s. And it was used, I mean, it made sense at the time. It was to feed animals. It was to feed animals and prevent erosion of farmlands across the south. But kudzu grows very, very rapidly. Friends, it can grow up to one foot per day. A foot a day, and it is very hard to kill. Soon, kudzu was covering trees and creeping up the sides of homes. They were covering and taking over power lines. It blocks out sunlight. It kills other plants and trees. It costs power companies millions of dollars. Millions of dollars each year to clear kudzu from power lines. And kudzu eradication programs can take seven to ten years. Seven to ten years to actually get rid of the stuff. Kudzu, kudzu seemed like a helpful agricultural plant at the time. As I said before, of course it did. It was when it was first imported. To this country, no one guessed for a second how destructive it could actually be once it took root. Unintended, but a serious nuisance. Well, our, our Bible study, our Bible passage today comes from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' first major teaching in the book of Matthew. Jesus has been, of course, preaching, has been teaching, has been casting out demons, he's of course been busy healing sickness, and as often would occur, a huge crowd develops. A big crowd gathered to see what he was going to do or what he was going to say next. So Jesus sits down, Jesus sits, sits down as he would customarily do, and he began to teach the gathered crowd about the kingdom of God, which we touched on last week. Now imagine, imagine if a new pastor, a new pastor came to Miamisburg and began performing miracles and preaching things, preaching things that were radically different from what most churches were teaching, don't you think? I mean, seriously. Don't you think that clergy and religious scholars and biblical study professors from local college, colleges and seminaries might turn out to stare, gossip, 
and question him? Well, of course they would. That's something. In fact, it's very similar to what happened when Jesus came to town. In Jesus' day, the religious leadership of the Jews was composed of four different groups, four different main groups, each with its own interpretation of the Torah. These were the Pharisees. You hear a lot about them. The Sadducees, the Zealots, and the Essenes. Now, the Pharisees, and I think most of you probably know this, the Pharisees believed in following traditions. They believed in following laws. They looked to the past for their standards and beliefs. The more liberal Sadducees claimed that the old laws and the old traditions needed to be reinterpreted for more modern times. That's the Sadducees. The Essenes believed that happiness came from separating oneself from the world. Separatists. They moved out into the wilderness. That's what they did. And lived monastic lives. They're the ones that gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls. Finally, there were the Zealots. The Zealots. The Zealots believed in political revolution. Political revolution. They believed that their faith called them to rebel. Rebel against any power that in any way threatened the Jews. Pastor John MacArthur writes, So the Pharisees were saying, go back. The Sadducees were saying, go forward. The Essenes were saying, go out. And the Zealots were saying, go against. That's it in a nutshell. And what the average folks in Jesus' day were probably saying is, go away. Now, I'm kidding, of course. But they probably got awful tired of the religious leaders creating more and more rules and more roadblocks between them and God. Naturally, quite naturally, each of these groups wanted Jesus to support their cause. And Jesus, of course, as usual, confounded, confounded their expectations. Which reminds me of, a, of an old story some of you will remember about a country preacher who had a teenage son who was trying to choose a future profession. One day, while the boy was away at school, his father decided to, he decided to try an experiment. He went into the boy's room he went in his bedroom, and what he did was he placed on his study table three objects, three objects, a Bible, a silver dollar, and a bottle of whiskey. Now then, said the uh, preacher to himself, I'll just hide behind the door here, and when my son comes home from school this afternoon, I'll see, I'll see which of these three objects he picks up. If he picks up the Bible, he's going to be a preacher just like me. If he picks up the, the, the dollar, he's going to be a businessman. But if he picks up the bottle, he's going to be a drunkard. A no good drunkard, Lord, what a shame that would be. Well, soon, soon the preacher heard his son's footsteps as he headed back to his room. The young man spotted the objects on the table he studied them for a moment, and then, then, of course, the moment of truth arrived. The young man picked up the Bible, and he placed it under his arm. Then he picked up the silver dollar, and he dropped it in his pocket. And finally, he uncorked that bottle and took a huge gulp of the whiskey. Lord, have mercy, the old man whispered. He's going to be a politician. <laughs> now, the crowds of people, the crowds of people that day, they were waiting and they were watching to see if Jesus would be a politician. That's what they're, that's what they're always waiting on. 
will he be a politician if he would shape his message to please his listeners? Would he please the Pharisees? Or was he going to please the Sadducees? Was he going to please the Essenes? Or is he going to please the Zealots? Now my guess is, my firm guess is that he shocked them all. And he customarily, he does this all the time. He shocked them all. Listen to his words in verses 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. What's going on here? What's going on here? On some occasions, Jesus seemed like a wild-eyed radical, welcoming prostitutes, welcoming tax collectors, and all kinds of riffraff into the kingdom, and saying things like, you've heard it said, but I say to you. But on this occasion, on this occasion, he sounds like the most dyed-in-the-wool traditionalist ever saying that you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you're more righteous than who? The Pharisees, the religious professionals. It's impossible for us to be as righteous as the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Many of the listeners are thinking to themselves as they hear Jesus say this, that's impossible. And now you're saying we have to surpass them? We have to surpass them in righteousness. Before we can enter the kingdom of heaven, you might as well give up now. And I think that's exactly what Jesus wanted them to feel. Whether they were Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, Zealots, or just ordinary folks like you and me, I believe that Jesus wanted them to rethink the role of the law in their lives. Now remember, the law, the law was given to bring us into relationship with God, not to save us. It was a miserable failure. If that was the point, no one can kept them. The minute you say, you say, I've kept the Ten Commandments, you've already broken them, you just got done lying, right? It's impossible. The law was given to bring us into relationship with God. The law was not created for itself just to have it. It was created to keep God's people in a safe, harmonious relationship with God and with each other. The law was an expression of God's protective love for us, but we ignored the relationship. That's what we did. We ignored it. We ignored the relationship God wanted with us and we fixated on the law instead. Let me give you an analogy. A shopkeeper in England, a shopkeeper in England named Sohan Singh has banned customers from his grocery store. He told a London newspaper that he was forced to take such drastic action because of people's bad manners. First, he banned smoking, then crude language, then baby strollers, then pets, and finally customers themselves. He banned the customers out. Shoppers now, what they got to do now is they got to look through a window. They look through a window to spot items that they want, and then they ring a bell, ding, ding, to be served through a little small hatch door. I have lost business 
Singh says. But I cannot say how much. I am a man of principles, and I stand by my decision. Now, I'll be honest with you, and I may be the only one in the room, and that's fine. I sympathize. I sympathize with some of Mr. Singh's principles. However, however, stores were created to serve customers, right? Of course, Mr. Singh would rather, Mr. Singh would rather have an empty but orderly store rather than a thriving but messy store. And it's going to be real interesting. It's going to be real interesting to see how long he stays in business. So the religious leaders, the religious leaders with whom Jesus clashed all the time, replaced a living relationship with God with the list of rules. They fixated on rigid obedience, rigid obedience to the law rather than a loving relationship with the Lord. The first laws given by God. You know this well. First laws given by God were given in the Garden of Eden. We read about this in Genesis 2. God created a beautiful, orderly, faithful world for Adam and Eve to enjoy. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, we read that God had one rule, one law to protect Adam and Eve in this perfect new world. One rule. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work at it and care for it. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not, must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Certainly what? Certainly what? Die. That was the penalty. Now let me ask you a question. And this is an important question. I always tell everybody here, it's not me, that just because I've been through school, I've got a theology, you've got a theology. That's just a fancy way of saying whatever it is you believe about God, you have a theology. Okay, it may be way up here, it may be down here, it may be in the middle, but you do have a theology. Let me ask you this question. When God told Adam and Eve, when God told Adam and Eve that there was a tree in the garden that was poisonous, that if they ate from it, they would die, was God threatening them or was he simply warning them? of what would happen if they ate of the fruit of the tree. It's up for you to answer. Is it a threat or is it a warning? And there's a world of difference between the two. I believe it's the latter. Those of you saying warning, I believe clearly it's the latter. Adam and Eve were created to live in a close, fruitful relationship with God and with each other. They were created to live in freedom. That's how we started. So long as they lived under the protection of God's one law. But Adam and Eve didn't trust God enough to honor that relationship, of course. So they decided to disobey. Even though they had it all, they're going to disobey the one law given by God. And they lost that relationship. What's the penalty? Death. They lost the relationship. It's that simple. And later, later, let's move on, we'll speed up the time clock here a little bit. God gave the law to Moses. He gave it to Moses as a way to bring Israel back into relationship with him and with each other. God's law was always rooted in love. Always. The first Mosaic law. The very first of what you and I call the Ten Commandments. The very first one is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And the law. 
The law establishes a relationship with God and serves as a reminder of God's love for us. This, this is the God who set us free from slavery. Don't, don't spend your lives chasing after and making sacrifices to false gods. Says fa our Father God, I am your God, I have set you free. The law was given to bring us into a relationship. A relationship with God. And that's the first thing that we need to see. Conversely, a relationship with God helps us understand the purpose of the law. It has a purpose. God's law has always been rooted in love and freedom. I'll give you another analogy that helps us understand this, this reality really quick. A woman, a woman was married to an abusive husband. And after they were married... What he does is, is he gives her a list of all the things he expected her to do. And in time, in time, she grew to hate that list. And she grew to hate the man that gave it to her. And after a few years, her husband died. Later, she married another man who was he was kind and loving to her. This husband had no list. He loved her unconditionally. And while going through some of the old boxes, she found her husband, her first husband's list. She realized that she was now, now she was doing all the things on the old list, but they weren't a chore. They weren't a chore anymore because they were done out of love and gratitude, not out of compulsion. The religious leaders, religious leaders of Jesus' day had turned the law into an act of external obedience instead of a reflection of the love of God. They, re they removed the joy. They removed the joy of living in obedient submission to God and they made it I knew a list of rules that burden people. Jesus says to us that the law was given to bring us into relationship with God and that conversely, a relationship with God helps us understand the purpose of the law. And that brings us logically to the final thing that needs to be said, and that's simply this. Jesus fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the law by giving us his righteousness so that we can enter his kingdom. That's the meaning of grace. That's what we mean. We throw that word grace around more than any other denomination. Grace. Grace. That's what grace is all about. That's what Jesus meant when he said that he didn't come to abolish the law. No. He didn't come to abolish it. He came to what? Fulfill it. Fulfill it. Because he knows we can't. He fulfilled it in his life by living in perfect relationship. He lived in perfect relationship with and perfect obedience to God the Father. And he fulfilled it in his death when he took on the penalty of the law, which is death, and gave us his righteous relationship so that God could give us eternal life. So to all those who think that they're never going to ever, ever going to be good enough to earn their way in, in the kingdom of God, you're right. If that's what you're capturing from what I'm saying is exactly what I'm saying. You're right. Give it up. Give it up now. You're going to fail before you even begin. That's me too. We've all failed. But that's the good news. That's the good news Jesus came to bring. We could never be good enough to fulfill all the requirements of the law. Are you kidding me? But Jesus was. Our Lord and Savior, glory be, was good enough to fulfill all the law's requirements. Like a lamb led to slaughter, he took the penalty for us and gave us his goodness his righteousness in its place. And do you want to stand? Do you want to stand before a holy God and claim that you're good enough to enter the kingdom of heaven? 
Or do you want the perfect son of God to stand in your place and open the gates of the kingdom for you? The choice is yours. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's remain seated and we'll join in our communion song.